Following Arthur Morgan's story and the six main story chapters of Red Dead Redemption 2 granted us a look in and around the United States in the late 19th century, the various towns, cities, swamps and islands teaching us more about life at the turn of the century. But now, in the game's epilogue, the century has well and truly turned. Arthur's story may be over, but the game is not. Thanks to Arthur's efforts, eight years later, in 1907, John Marston is trying to build a life for his family, and in doing so, gives us much more history to uncover. Let's take a look at the real history of Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm sorry, sir. What was that? I said you're a bad influence. On your mother. With your books. Which books was that? You know, that dime novel, a Boy Calloway and the Men from the Moon, or whatever it was. This would certainly be accurate. Tales of the Frontier existed while the Frontier was expanding, as early as the early 1800s, with novels like the Leatherstocking Tales series. The Western genre really kicked off with Penny Dreadfuls and dime novels, which were discussed back in Chapter 2. The first dime novel was published in June 1860. From around 1880, the genre became successful in continental Europe, with the publication of full novels by non-American authors like Carl May. And by 1900, cheap pulp magazines in the US allowed Easterners to relate to the tales of Western adventures. Do you enjoy tales of the Wild West? Not so much. Anymore. I've been reading about knights. You know, of the round table. There are several books that discuss Arthurian legends, dating back to the 9th century, though they became much more popular around the 12th century. By the late 1800s, there were dozens of English language books about this topic. There's King Arthur, and there's Sir Lancelot, and the Lady Guinevere, and a whole lot of others. Anyone familiar with the legend of King Arthur knows how true this is. According to legend, Arthur led the Celtic Britons in battle against the Saxon invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. He was married to Lady Guinevere, who, as some stories say, began an affair with Sir Lancelot, Arthur's close companion and one of the greatest knights of the Round Table. There are any number of knights depending on the story, with some claiming as few as 13, and some up to as many as 1600 though most commonly there were between 100 and 300. The name of this mission, the Wheel, may also have some relevance to the story of King Arthur. The Rota Fortunae, or Wheel of Fortune, serves as a symbol of the nature of fate, and Thomas Mallory's famous story The Death of Arthur uses it in this manner, with the Wheel symbolising the concept that even the best humans have flaws, that even those with poor morals retain the capacity for redemption and to become a good person. In this mission, John and Abigail look for work in the town of Strawberry. Interestingly, there are several real-life areas by this name in the US. A town in Arkansas, a ghost town in Nevada, and at least six unincorporated districts in Arizona, California, South Carolina, and Utah. Of these, the town in the game most closely resembles the unincorporated community of Strawberry in El Dorado County, California, which became a popular tourist resort around the 1850s, not too dissimilar to the town in the game. Interestingly, the watermelon strawberry bears a striking resemblance to the Glade Creek Grist Mill, a popular photography spot in Babcock State Park, West Virginia. I'm gonna go see what kind of good, honest work I can find. Grave digging or polishing some rich fella's boots or some such. Shoe shining as a profession is thought to have existed at least as long as branded shoe polish itself, so around the early 19th century. Interestingly, the earliest known photograph of a human taken in 1838 or 39, features a man having his shoe shined. Time's hard, Mr. Uh, Milton. Jim Milton. Some believe that John's use of this name is a reference to John Milton, the English poet and intellectual who famously wrote Paradise Lost, an epic poem concerning the biblical story of the fall of man. Most notably, Milton originally envisioned this story to be based on a legendary king, such as the legend of King Arthur, Coincidence? At the beginning of the next mission, we see Abe using a grindstone to sharpen one of his tools. Of course, this is most certainly accurate, with grindstones having existed for centuries by this point, and the treadle and crank mechanism being introduced around 1480, over 400 years earlier than here. 
Is it true what they said about you when you arrived? It, that you ran off those hired guns? The term hired gun doesn't appear to be in print until several decades after the game, but the now gun has been used as slang for a professional criminal since the mid 1800s, so it makes sense for someone to have said this phrase at some point between those dates. Been these parts before, but that was years ago. Oh, <laughs> it's changed. The rich fellas are coming in and buying everything. This is unsurprising. The Homestead Act of 1862 allowed citizens to claim surveyed government land. They were required to live on the land and improve it through cultivation for five years, after which point they were entitled to the property through only a small registration fee. It's said that small farmers acquired more land under this act in the 20th century than the 19th, which may be where Mr. Geddes comes in. Well, it ain't as wild as it once were, at least. We discussed this back in chapter one, but it's even truer now than it was then. The Wild West is generally considered to have ended by the turn of the century, so it was even less wild in 1907 than in 1899. Of course, some popular Wild West figures lived into the 20th century, and the frontier expansion continued well into the 1910s, but this is often seen as the footnote to the Wild West. As far as most historians are concerned, the Wild West was essentially over. What was you doing before you came here? I told you. Wife got cheated out of inheritance. We was in a legal dispute. It was a bad time. The concept of inheritance and wills dates back to ancient Greece, where they were usually signed before several witnesses. They were further developed in ancient Rome, where they were influenced by Christianity, and in England, where distinctions began to be made between actual and personal property. At the end of this mission, as John and Abigail both leave for work, Jack is seen reading a book. More specifically, he's reading Otis Miller and the Boy from New York, one of the penny dreadfuls about the legendary gunslinger. Otis Miller seems pretty clearly based on the famous outlaw Jesse James, a connection made most obvious in one of the game's newspapers, which reprints a folk song about Otis Miller that is very similar to a real life folk song about Jesse James, and as a result gives the two outlaws a lot of similarities such as a brother named Frank, a son named after them who was arrested and acquitted for train robbery, and the fact that both men were shot and killed by members of their gangs. Perhaps more relevant though, is the fact that Jesse James was also the subject of several dime novels in the early 1900s, which physically bear a striking resemblance to the one Jack is reading here. Oh, heck! Hey, maybe them Laramie boys weren't so tough after all, hmm? Interestingly, the word Laramie seems to have a strong association with the state of Wyoming. It's the name of both a city and a county in the state. Fort Laramie is the name of both a Wyoming town and a former military institution. The Laramie River and Laramie Mountains run through Colorado and Wyoming. And in 1898, the Missionary District of the Platte was renamed Missionary District of Laramie after it was expanded to include parts of Wyoming. A coincidence, however, this most likely is not. One of the game's newspapers refers to the group as the Laramie Corporation, noting that, under the guidance of the Cattle Association, they are visiting small farm owners offering large sums of money. Unsurprisingly, these organizations conceptually resemble the Wyoming Stock Growers Association, originally called the Stock Association of Laramie County. The group was established in 1872 to organize the cattle industry in the area, but before long it had grown into a political force that was essentially the government of the Wyoming Territory. Specifically regarding the group's resemblance to the Laramie Gang, well in 1892, Frank Walcott, one of the group's members, hired around 50 gunmen, including known Texas killers, to eliminate alleged rustlers in Johnson County. On April 8th, they murdered Nathan Champion, accusing him of being a rustler and pinning a note on his chest reading, Cattle Thieves Beware. However, Champion wasn't a cattle rustler at all. He was just a small rancher who stood up against the unfair practices of the association. A familiar story. Anybody want some more? Uh, no, no, I'm thank good. You. I miss Mr. Pearson. John Marston, you're such a pig! <laughs> Interestingly, pig had been used as an insult for almost 400 years at this point, seemingly originating around the 1540s. Perhaps more interesting, though far less related, is that the term had been used to refer to police officers for close to 100 years, since 1811. You're all so tough! 
Come have a word with me. You here to cut a deal? This certainly isn't the first time we've heard this phrase, but it has an interesting origin. The oldest written reference is cited in around 1979, though its oral usage is likely much older. In fact, an article by Bruce William Jones argues that it may have a history of nearly 4,000 years, originally written in Biblical Hebrew, specifically referring to the ancient act of cutting up an animal when entering an agreement with someone, as referenced in old texts. In one of the next missions, John goes to the post office to pick up deliveries for Mr. Geddes, as well as a parcel for Abigail. Now the post office was established in 1792 in the Postal Service Act. Shopping in this manner, meanwhile, was introduced to the United States by the first mail order catalogue in 1845, Tiffany's Blue Book. A pioneering mail order business, Montgomery Ward, produced its first mail order catalogue in 1872, cutting out the intermediary and allowing the prices to be lower. Richard Warren Sears, meanwhile, started selling watches through mail order catalogues in 1888, subsequently leading to the very popular Sears Roebuck and Co catalogues, which are imitated elsewhere in the game. Hey, Mr. Jim? Mr. Jim? Hey! Uh, there's a telegram messenger for you. In more urban areas, telegram messengers would travel by bicycle, so much so that the Western Union Telegraph Company would buy 5,000 bicycles a year and resell them to telegraph boys at a discount. I say boy because in these areas, telegram messengers were usually young men between the ages of 10 and 18. The telegram that John receives has been sent through the Ellsworth Wrought Telegraph Company. The word wrought refers to what hath God wrought, a phrase from the Bible's Book of Numbers that was also the first ever telegraph message sent long distance from Baltimore to Washington by Samuel Morse in 1844. The word Ellsworth, meanwhile, refers to Annie Ellsworth, the daughter of one of Morse's friends, who suggested that he use the phrase in the first place. Jim, stop. If you're the JM I know, stop. The reason there are so many stops throughout the message is because punctuation costs extra to send, whereas an extra word like stop was free so it was often used in the place of commas or full stops. This isn't the only message John receives in this mission. He finds a letter for him by Abigail. Part of you is hell-bent on ending up the same way. The term hell-bent is traced back to around the first half of the 1800s. A similar phrase is hell-bent for leather, sometimes just hell for leather, meaning as fast as possible, first printed in 1889. Just interested, that's all. Ain't nothing interesting, unless you find gossip about a man's marriage worthy of your time. Interestingly, the word gossip originally referred to someone who was close to you who you could share your personal life with, like a sibling or a friend. From around the 16th century, it usually referred to a person who would delight in idle talk, also known as a tattler or newsmonger. Later, the word was redefined to refer to the conversation itself, or the act of it. Of course, it was seen as something that only women did, not because men didn't do it, but when men did gossip, they saw it as more important. A discussion, not a whisper, so it wasn't labelled as such. In one of the chapter's last missions, John heads to Blackwater for the first time in the game. Interestingly, there are quite a few places called Blackwater in the United States. A census-designated place in Arizona, an archaeological site in New Mexico, a dam in New Hampshire, but the one with the most in common to the game is Blackwater, Missouri, particularly because it's a relatively small city with a similar layout, though to be fair that layout wasn't exactly uncommon. Blackwater, Missouri was mapped in 1887, having functioned as a trading point for some time beforehand. Similarly, Blackwater, West Elizabeth had apparently been nothing more than a small trading post in the decades before the game, though it was founded sometime earlier, in 1767. Like a lot of locations in the game though, Blackwater is likely an amalgamation of several real-life areas. It's regularly compared to Texas, particularly the cities of Dallas, Houston and Galveston, mostly due to their proximity to water and their political and economic significance. Oklahoma City is another possible candidate for this reason. In any case, it's unlikely that there's one singular answer. In this mission, John visits the West Elizabeth Cooperative Bank to attain a bank loan in order to buy Beach's Hope. Cooperative banks are generally known as credit unions in the United States, owned and managed by its members, all of whom have accounts within the bank. The first credit union in the US was St. Mary's Bank in New Hampshire, established in 1908, one year after the events in the game. 
The West Elizabeth Cooperative Bank, meanwhile, is said to have been established in 1851, so either it was established as a credit union far beyond its time, or perhaps renamed quite recently, so only a little beyond its time. As for the bank loan, around this time, the late 1800s and early 1900s, five or six year amortisation periods were fairly standard. Borrowers often had to pay 50% of the purchase up front, followed by interest only payments and a large balloon payment for the remaining loan balance in the final month. However, the short repayment time and the hefty down payment required meant that it was mostly the wealthy who would apply for bank loans, rather than the standard citizen. In the bank, you can spot a typewriter. Fascinatingly, there are several predecessors to the typewriter dating back to the 1500s, and several typing and printing machines were patented in the US and Europe in the early 1800s, but none were commercially produced until 1870, the Hansen Writing Ball in Denmark, which became highly successful in Europe. It was, of course, followed by many others by many other companies, like the Hammond Typewriter Company in the US in 1881, Fitch Typewriter Company in London in 1891, and the Underwood Typewriter Company in New York in 1895 so its existence and usage in 1907, especially in a bank, is entirely unsurprising. These last two missions, the landowning classes and home of the gentry, have fitting titles. The gentry are people of high social class. In the United Kingdom specifically, the landed gentry refers to the social class of landowners who had a country estate and were able to live entirely through rental income. The second name, home of the gentry, is also the title of a Russian novel published in 1859. When John makes it to Beecher's Hope, he chases off some squatters, either by killing them or giving them $10. That might not sound like much, but it's the equivalent of around $317 today, so it makes a bit more sense. Towards the end of this mission, John bumps into everyone's favourite uncle, Uncle. <laughs> I saw you going into the bank, and by the looks of things, you ain't robbed it. I've gone straight. The word straight, meaning honest or true, dates back to the 1520s. The term go straight, however, apparently dates to around 1919, so about 12 years later than John uses it here. As most informal or slang terms though, tracing the exact origin isn't always precise, so it was almost certainly used at some point before then. I've gone straight! Oh, bull crap! No. The first use of this word, or at least the more vulgar version, dates to around 1914 in both British and American slang, but Uncle is a man ahead of his time, so his usage is unsurprising. The word crap being swapped out for its vulgar equivalent dates back to around 1846, the first recorded use of the word referring to bodily waste. Speaking of bodily waste, Uncle convinces John to let him stick around. I'll come too. No, you don't have to. No, I'm real sick, John. Lumbago. The noun lumbago is derived from the late Latin word meaning backache of the lumbar region, and that's what lumbago is, lower back pain. A report from 1862 showed that railway workers had greater sickness than many other occupations, and that lumbago was one of the main reasons, becoming an increasing problem between 1860 and 1880. More recently, the term lumbago was deemed too general by the medical community, so more specific terminology is used instead. Lack of specificity sounds like an uncle's special though. Even in its extensive epilogue, Red Dead Redemption 2 allows us to continue looking at the history of the United States, now in the early 20th century, rather than the late 19th. But the epilogue is far from being over. John has bought himself a ranch at Beecher's Hope, and now needs to work to pay off his debt to the bank. And in doing so, we'll have a little more history to uncover. Thank you.